the heyday of imperialism. I mean, Africa all of a sudden became the property of uh, these countries. Look at this, 1913, uh, we saw this last week, the stuff in blue are French colonies. That's, you see most of West Africa, parts of North Africa, a little bit of equatorial uh, Africa down here, Madagascar islands. Uh, and again, for information, this sort of pink stuff is British. So there you have East Africa and South Africa. Here's uh, what's now the Union of South Africa here, Zambia and uh, uh, Zimbabwe, Northern and Southern Rhodesia, the old names, some a uh, little bit of uh, British stuff here, Nigeria. There were also Portuguese colonies in green here, uh, German colonies in gray, and Spanish colonies in the yellow, and Italian colonies. So the European powers thought it was theirs for the taking. We also talked about the Dreyfus affair in the late 1890s, where a Jewish officer is accused of being a traitor, uh, even though it was clear that the evidence against him was counterfeited, the army refused to give in. And the case I was making is that although it's clearly a case of anti-Semitism, it's also a case of the army and the old style uh, pro-monarchy people okay. against the Republic. So it's not just the case of Alfred Dreyfus, although the poor man suffered a lot. Uh, somebody's got a, uh, a microphone that's not muted. Please mute it. Here is a picture of the ceremonial degradation of uh, Dreyfus here. They break, breaking his sword over someone's knee as a symbol of his being kicked out of the army. And as I mentioned, such a thing could, you never could have had a Dreyfus affair in Germany because no Jewish officer or no Jew would ever be allowed to be an office in, in the pre-First World War German army. Uh, we mentioned Jean Jaurès, the famous French orator. Here he is haranguing the crowd. Uh, and he was actually in 1914, still a spokesman for peace and was assassinated in a restaurant. Uh, he led the French socialists to a major political force. World War I came and we mentioned what's called the, the Union Sacre, Sacred Union, that is all the parties say, we're gonna support our government. Uh, and that lasted for a while. And then we got the Battle of Verdun, this horrible 1916 battle, where you're talking about a million people or more are injured or killed. Well, here we go, end of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, and we mentioned some of that. Uh, most of what you read is about Europe, although there are other things happening. But remember, Alsace-Lorraine, French get it back. They lost it in 1870. They get it back in 1919. They lose it in 1940. They get it back in 1945. So it's still there in France. And these other areas, uh, have special rights of the French until the Germans pay off an enormous uh, amount of reparations. You know, the Rhineland is, this whole area here is supposed to be demilitarized. The Ruhr in 1923 is occupied by the French army for a while. So uh, it's an unsettled Europe. But let's look at the First World War for a minute because I've been talking about liberty at home imperialism abroad. So here you have, why do, what did the French want in, with their colonies? For one thing, they got a lot of soldiers, you know, 440,000, that's a lot of soldiers starting with the, uh, what I call forced recruitment, that is the draft. Uh, and there's one estimate that says that the probability of being killed at the front was two and a half times higher than that of a French infantryman. 
Uh, here you have some images from that time. And what's one, two, three are, are the translations of the captions of these pictures. This one's African infantry. I forgot to translate that. It says, our French soldiers. Here, glory to the greater France, an African soldier. And here's a day celebrating the army from Africa and the colonial troops. That is to say, not from the troops, but the troops are celebrating. That's something called the Senegalese sharpshooters. The Senegalese are, really stands for all the West Africans. But they had Algerians, Tunisians, Moroccans. Uh, they were at first in separate units, but there were so many killed and wounded in the 1914 that they began to be integrated with the European troops. Some black officials promised military service as a means to obtain political and legal rights after the war. It never happened, but this was the one of the, the complaints that outsiders made. You know, you're promising all these things. You send these guys in. Uh, where they used as cannon fodder as the charge was, well, Clemenceau, Clemenceau says, we're going to offer civilization to the blacks. They will have to pay for that. I would prefer that 10 blacks are killed rather than one Frenchman. A pretty ugly comment here. Uh, here you have a picture of uh, colonial troops marching. They were also sent to Russia to fight against the Bolsheviks. You know, the French, French, Americans, and British all sent troops to fight against the Bolsheviks, but the, among the French were a lot of colonial troops. So this is the ongoing imperialism. So the so-called uh, liberty at home is not immediately translated into any further rights, no matter what they uh, uh, promised. I was reminded the other day that when I was in Mainz, uh, it's a German city in, in, uh, near the Rhine, in the Rhineland, I visited a cemetery and I saw all these gravestones in Arabic because they had a lot of Algerians who served there during the 1920s. And they died there, you know, as people do die. But it's a, it was a, a striking reminder of what happened after the First World War. And, what, uh, and here they are all through the, uh, the, the the 20s. Well, what, have, what did the colonial troops things think? Well, first of all, we have this image that the whites are no longer all powerful. They're no longer almighty devils. Uh, you know, here are various pictures of French troops in Africa. And I mean, this one on the top, I'm not sure whether they're posing them to make them look funny to Europeans. Yeah, these are Africans and we give them uniforms, but they still wear their tribal hats. Whereas opposed to, here's what they, they look like later on. They look like regular uniforms, even though, and again, you have the white officer and the black troops. We'll see that continues into the second world war. We'll look at that in a few minutes. But there's a greater self-confidence in the colonies. So, and you have, uh, at the same time, German propaganda is filled with racist notions against the, the black French soldiers, whereas the French general population share this image of Africans as bloodthirsty savages. I think that's what this picture is supposed to represent. So that despite any service, and as you saw half a million, almost half a million Africans served in the French army, there's no notion of their being equal to the regular citizens. And then you get this image of, uh, this is from World War II, but it applies to the World War I as well. You know, they are bloodthirsty savages. Senegalese uh, tirailleurs, sharpshooters. That's an old, that's actually a video game. 
I mean, the, fr the French even said, oh, these guys should be barefoot or our boots don't fit. I mean, it's just horrible things that were going on. We don't have a lot of written material about the African experience in the, in the First World War. So I'm just, one generalizes on, you know, on suppositions, but I think this is sort of my impressions and of other historians of what was going on. Well, back to the Treaty of Versailles. And as I mentioned, it's the high point of imperialism and not just in those little things like Alsace-Lorraine. Here's the Middle East. There's something in 1916, you may remember from another course called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And Sykes and Picot, British and French, draw up this agreement, which is never officially recognized, but it sort of lays out more or less what happened. So here is uh, the French, Lebanon, Syria, this is Northern Iraq, Armenia, which uh, is, uh, these are under French influence, not control. The British get what's now Jordan, the rest of Iraq, uh, this whole area of Eastern Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the Russians are involved too in Iran. Uh, the Italians are not shown on the map, but they uh, are looking at uh, Ethiopia and Libya. The UN, and not sorry, not the UN, the League of Nations, sets up what's called a mandate system. That is, they are going to prepare countries for independence. That's the, the theory. And so you get mandates that is locally controlled government. So the French here have Syria and Lebanon, the British, Palestine, Transjordan. They, the British hold on to Cyprus and they still are very influential in Egypt. If you recall, uh, I talked about France and Britain being competitors in Egypt. And I gave a little more detail about Egypt just to see what was going on. We talked about Egyptian cotton, which was so important as a high quality cotton, although that's, they've lost that ability to create that long thread cotton. Uh, Palestine becomes a hot issue as the Zionists and the uh, early Palestinian nationalists clash here. Uh, France at home really had severe problems. 1.3 million soldiers had died. I mean, this is really quite a thing for a country that which was what, probably 40 to 50 million at the beginning of the war. The birth rate did not recover and they had a lot of huge, they had huge tax increases to try to recover. And what they thought is, it's all Germany's fault. Germany has to pay. And one of the light motifs of the interwar period is this demand that Germany pay reparations. And Germany first didn't want to pay reparations. And secondly, they rejected the notion that was built in the Treaty of Versailles that said it was all Germany's fault. And you get a famous or infamous book, depending on who you are, John Maynard Keynes, you know, the great economist, he was not internationally known as an economist then, he was a high level British bureaucrat. He, he was at the conference and he resigned because he saw what was happening. He wrote this book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And uh, it became really internationally very uh, influential that uh, it said, Germany can't afford it. You're really destroying the economy of Europe by doing what you're doing with the Treaty of Versailles. The book is still read uh, on the historical level as a uh, evidence of what was going on in the, right after the First World War. 
You also have Indochina, you know, which we unfortunately became very familiar with as a wartime zone. But between the two world wars, you have a puppet regime. I have a picture of him here somewhere. Oops, I don't want that yet. Uh, okay, well, that's Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh is at Versailles pleading for an independent Vietnam, not even called Vietnam, Indochina. Here he is as a young man, here he is addressing the French Communist Party, which gave him a lot of support. And what we have is Tonkin, which is the core of what we later called North Vietnam. Annam, down here it becomes the, uh, the South Vietnam and various levels of influence in Laos, Cambodia, conflicts with Thailand. Uh, so, you know, this, we became all too familiar with this geography in the 1960s and 70s and in France earlier. In 1931, there was a strike of plantation workers and the French responded by shooting people out of hand. I mean, it's a horrible scene. That is, if you had a strike in France, you couldn't imagine them machining them, machine gunning them, but it happened in, in Indochina. And we have Bao Dai, the uh, puppet emperor. Here's a picture of Bao Dai. Uh, who was there from 1926 to 1945. And he is there to do the French bidding. You know, he's not a, not a powerful governor. And obviously the people behind him are not native Vietnamese. Uh, this cap is characteristic of the French army. Uh, the pith helmet, which we always associate with colonial administrators. Here he is. We also see the establishment of the League of Nations. And as I mentioned, the mandate system set, uh, was set up in countries where they did not have continuing direct imperialism. Syria and Lebanon are the countries that we you might be most familiar with. He, here's the infamous or famous, whoever you want to call him, T.E. Lawrence right here, who helps to egg on uh, Emir Faisal at the peace conference. Actually, T.E. Lawrence is on his left, he's on our right. Uh, guess I'm having a little trouble here with my left and right. Uh, these are obviously uh, French soldiers wearing uh, desert headdress. And what they pleaded for was that he should become, Faisal become king or ruler of Syria. He never got what he wanted. He got a, uh, uh, his consolation prize was Jordan and parts of Iraq. But Syria eventually, now seen by the US as a big enemy, but it gets his independence there. Uh, and in 1943, Syria and Lebanon are officially independent and the French troops leave in 1946. It's the first time they ever vacated a colonial area. Uh, we'll see that during the Second World War, the French regime, uh, that is what's called the Vichy regime, attempted to hold on to its colonies and the Gauls free French One of those colonies too. It's not as though these are people talking about independence. And the formula for Lebanon, some of you may be familiar with, uh, dividing up, you know, the president has to be a Maronite Christian. The other officers of state, such as the uh, prime minister and the head of parliament have to be from other, either a, a Sunni Muslim or a Shiite Muslim. Uh, it's a very divided society. We also have, we don't talk about this much, Cameroon. Cameroon had been a German colony. So the French and the British split it between them. 
it's now you know an independent country, Cameroon. But and it, it's interesting that the official languages are French and English, depending on who took them over in the interwar period. Uh, as I say, it was it had been a German colony, so the victorious powers divided up the the old colonies. Here's uh, it doesn't give you so much of Africa, but if you think of the uh, the west coast of Africa swinging around here, and then like this, you know, in Africa goes down south. Here's Cameroon right in that corner next to Algeria and next to Nigeria. Another mark of change of imperialism, we have a particular famous man by the name of Aimé Césaire. He died in 2008. Césaire was from Martinique in the Caribbean, but he was, came to be educated in France. <laughs> Excuse me. Educated in France. He came up with the something that he called la negritude. Uh, hard to, I'm not sure how to translate that. It's the quality of being black. And he talks about a common black identity to, and he wants to reject French colonial racism. He becomes very influential in what he uh, publishes. Here we have a, uh, a, I'm not sure what that was, some kind of plaque. Moi libre aussi, I want to be free too. And, he, and this, obviously, a black person is pointing to 1789. So here we have the notion liberty, equality, fraternity, 1789 is what the colonial peoples are asking for here. That is, those <coughs> ideals are still alive. And it's something that the you know, important in France. And he says, negritude, again, it's a word I have trouble translating. It's not a philosophy, not a metaphysics. It is a way of living history within history, the history of a community whose experience appears to be unique. Now he's from Martinique in the Caribbean. With, you know, we have uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique, and on the uh, South African, uh, South American continent, you have Guyane, or French, what was called French Guiana at the time. These populations are not completely uh, of African origin. There are a lot of uh, people from India, but that is, is something that negritude comes out and it becomes important for Africans too. Uh, People rejected the idea that colonization and Christianity brought civilization to the African peoples. And so it, the spokesman in Europe becomes a uh, French, French, a Senegalese intellectual, Leopold Senghor. Uh, he was the first president of Senegal, independent Senegal from 1960 to 1980. He was the first African ever to be elected as a member of the Académie Française, which is a very prestigious, uh, limited membership institution in France. I don't wanna to talk too much about the Académie, but let's just know it's really very prestigious. Uh, and he's regarded as one of the most important African intellectuals of the 20th century. And he becomes involved as a spokesman for, for La Negritude. Here he is, uh, Leopold Senghor. Now, after the Second World War, and as the 20th century moves on, not everybody uh, is impressed, although Salt, Jean-Paul Salt, he, he analyzed negritude as the opposite of colonial racism, and he helped introduce that concept of French intellectuals. But later on, you have a decline of enthusiasm, and it's criticized as being defensive. Navola Soyinka, some of you may know, is a writer from, uh, I was going to say Nigeria, but I'm probably wrong because he comes out in French here. A tiger does not proclaim its tigritude. It jumps on its prey. 
that is Soyinka, in addition to being a writer, is also to saying that Africans need to stand up for themselves and not be so defensive as what might be suggested in Negritude. Uh, I don't think that Soyinka would reject M.A. Cezale, just saying that things had developed after Cezale and after Singal, then Africans have to be more positive in their talk about what their identity is. Well, while this is, while the French are so involved with colonialism, they have plenty of problems at home. They have a low birth rate. They get a certain number of immigrants from Italy and Spain and Poland to the point where in the 1930s, 10% of the adult males come from abroad. I saw some of this, uh, remnants of this when I was in Poland, uh, a man named Edward Gierek became the uh, prime minister of Poland in the 1970s. He had uh, gotten his trade union experience in the coal mining unions of, in France in the interwar period. When the depression and then the second, then the depression came, he, uh, he left, went back to Poland. Farming was really inefficient. Although it's interesting that the French government tried to, to uh, do something about the low birth rate, not very successfully. For example, in 1920, the sale of contraceptives was prohibited. Uh, women suffered, they were only allowed to be achieve a majority and be an independent uh, person in 1938. Until then, they had been subject either to their fathers or their husbands. In the 30s, you get this yearning for a new society, but there's extremism on both the left and the right. Here we have miners on strike with that bent arm and the, and the fist clenched as the traditional socialist, later communist salute. Uh, on the left side here, we see down with fascism demonstration in the 1930s. I don't see, I see very few women in that picture. There are a few, there's one here, there's one over here. Uh, people camping out and trying to enjoy themselves in the middle of a very difficult scene. Uh, and there was, Stavisky was a con man and his corruption was exposed in 1934, it led to some real right-wing riots against the government. The government was blamed for what had happened. And the opposition then amalgamated and for the first time you have what's called the Popular Front. Popular Front was an alliance of the center and moderate left. Uh, it was supported by the communists for the first time in, until the mid thirties, the communist parties in, in most of Europe, particularly in our cases in France and in Germany, saw their major enemies to be the socialists. They were directed by the Communist International, the Comintern, which was looking for uh, power over the working classes. And they didn't point out the enemies as being on the right, they were looking against those socialists. So in 36 and 37, you have that popular front. And if you recall, I talked once before about the French Commune of 1870 is still alive in the vision of the left. And here the popular front is also still alive. This is a picture of a rally, Léon Blanc, who was the prime minister. We'll see his face in a minute is giving that salute, which I just showed you. Uh, when he came into office, you get 133 laws in 73 days. Here's Bone waving his arms in triumph. You know, yet things such as two weeks of paid vacation, 40 hour work week, required schooling up until the age of 14, 
new public works. You know, the kind of stuff that we now associate with our modern society just comes out in the 1930s. So if you pass laws for this, you can imagine that before this, you don't have paid vacation. You don't have a limit 40 hours work week. You have a younger age for schooling and so on. So oh, there, there I captioned for Leon Blum. Uh, he didn't stay prime minister long, but he, as I said, he's still a hero to parts of the left. And there's a socialist salute. Well, in the 1930s, you have left versus right. Now, here, here's this right-wing fascist salute. Straight arm. It, it comes, I'm, I'm pretty sure it comes from the uh, Italian fascists, but it was adopted by the French right. It's adopted by the Nazis in Germany. And here you have them giving that salute. Uh, and you even have rather Hitler than Blum. I mean, this, I mean it's sort of this really ugly uh, division of society. You know, Blum is a socialist, he's a Jew, and he's tolerated by the communists. All of this really feeds right-wing anger. So, uh, in 1939, uh, you have the, the Nazi-Soviet pact and Blum is sort of pushed to the side. But I should say this about Blum. The colonies remain colonies. They send socialists to be administrators, but they saw colonialism as modernizing and progressive. They were not anti-colonialists. You know, they still talked about what we mentioned last week as the civilizing mission of France. Uh, so in 37, as a, a sign of this social unrest, here's a building bombed by right-wing extremists. And they're called the cagoulard, the, uh, the hooded ones. Meanwhile, you have the Popular Front, what's going on in the colonies? Blum, and, a, and then a uh, member of parliament named, named Violette made a proposal that would enable a small number of Algerian Muslims, that people who are highly educated and were military ve veterans, to obtain French citizenship while still being subject to Muslim law on some family issues in particular. And even this was enormously controversial among the colonists in Algeria. They did not want anything attributed to the Muslims. So you have, oops, I didn't want to do that. So here is, at home, you have a demonstration dancing in the streets. You notice here a lot more women than in other pictures. And the civilizing mission continues in the colonies, but at the same time, you have in Algiers, this Blum Violetta proposal is seen as a good thing. It doesn't get it doesn't get passed. Even that little bit doesn't get passed. I wanted to mention here Albert Camus, who is sort of a hero to some people now. Uh, he first became known as a journalist in Algeria. Camus was a was Algerian, and he wrote he's wrote an expose of enormous poverty in a part of Algeria that had been ignored by the French public. So Camus, who becomes a hero in the French resistance during the Second World War, he becomes rejected in the 1950s because he's not in favor of the same French rule in Algeria, but he can't bring himself to talk about independence for Algeria. So he's caught in the middle. But I mention him because, you know, he's a Nobel Prize winner, he's considered a major writer in the 20th century. And that's when he first emerged in the popular imagination. We had Algeria. Now, as I said, independence for Syria and Lebanon is moving along, although the French thought that they continued, could continue to control those countries indirectly and right-wing extremism. Here's an example of a poster. 
that was against the communists in the 30s. Communism is making all property commonly owned. Your herds, your goods, they're mine as well as yours. So this is this notion of what the communists would do and it's a threat to the peasants. And here's the hammer and sickle in the background. And uh, this is a sort of a stereotype dress of the communists. And L'Action Francaise, the uh, French action, this right-wing group, which was started, as you recall, in the 1890s at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. In the 1930s, uh, when, Le when uh, Blum becomes prime minister, here you have this other, France under the Jew. So, you know, the... the on the right, it says, under the revolutionary menace, panic in Paris. That is, society really splits here and Blum becomes a convenient, uh, convenient target because he's Jewish. Then in 1939, some of you are probably, most of you will know that what we consider the beginning of the Second World War in Europe started when Poland was invaded, 1939, and Britain and France claimed that uh, they were going to go to war with Germany because they're going to protect Poland. And they didn't do anything. They said they declared war, but that was it until 1940 in the spring of 1940, the Nazis invade France. France had what was called the Maginot Line. It was a line of fortifications that was they thought was impregnable. So the Nazis just went around it. They invaded through Belgium. What happened is that they were overrun so quickly that the British had to get out. And there's this uh, well-known evacuation at the, on the beaches at Dunkirk where 200,000 British soldiers and 140,000 French are evacuated. And there is you know, this famous scene and we don't know why it was even permitted. Some people think that uh, Hitler thought he could still ally with the British as part of the superior Anglo-Saxon race. But what happened, instead of uh, this alliance with Britain, you have the, the Battle of Britain. And at the same time in France, we have a, a government called, set up in the town of Vichy, here it is, you have this German occupation zone and a supposedly free area, the free zone. Vichy government lasts for several years. Uh, so they had some independent action. Uh, this stuff being uh, in green stripes, that's Italy annexing part of France. Although I have to say that France annexed it from Italy in the, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, so anyway, here's what you have. Uh, Alsace-Lorraine is annexed to Germany immediately. And I remember visiting Alsace-Lorraine where you have, uh, since it was considered part of Germany, the what happened is that, please, somebody's got to mute their phone, please. Please mute that phone. Please mute that phone. A voicemail to clarify what was said. Today, Tuesday, July 19th, the Houston Commons front entrance is closed. The entrance to the Houston Commons is closed on both sides. All right. Sorry. Let's go back to where we were. Here's France occupied from uh, first the German occupation zone here. And uh, I was saying, Alsace-Lorraine, uh, I was amazed to see some tablets. French 
citizens were killed in Russia because they had been drafted into the German army. If you lived in Alsace, well, you, then you're German. And they sent French soldiers to Russia who were killed. Uh, and of course, the, the German attacks on the Jews were instituted uh, in 1940 and 41. They're barred from many occupations. The French start having certain concentration camps. Uh, and let's go back for a second. Liberty, equality, and fraternity are replaced. Larry? Yes. Excuse me, you're on presenter view. Again? You are on presenter view. So we're seeing the notes. Oh, okay. Let's do this. If you can fix this. Yeah, there you go. I, I like the notes. Yeah, well. They're my, my they're my cheat sheets as we used to call them in the in the in college. Uh, so we're going to do this, and then we're going to uh, we should be able to reverse. There we go. We can reverse that. All right. You can't see all my little notes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The government at Vichy. The new slogan for France, family, work, fatherland. Forget about liberty, equality, fraternity. We're going to have family, work, fatherland. And I have to say, they didn't invent this. This is stuff that had been circulating among French in the 1920s and 30s. It's not as though everybody was in love with liberty, equality, fraternity. Here you have a poster. It says, Nash, I'm, I'll give you the translation here. National Revolution, and it says right here, France and company, meaning run by the capitalists, particularly Jewish capitalists, and what characterizes it? Laziness, demagogy, and internationalism. This is what France is. And it's, and you see this uh, six pointed star. The implication is that it's run by Jews. And what do we replace it with? We have the National Revolution, France. You can translate France, it's right there. And we have schools, artisanry, the peasantry, what they call legion. I assume that's the army. That's, those are the pillars. And what do we have? We have discipline, order, savings, and courage, all to create work, family, and fatherland. I mean, this is really something new in French society. So Vichy is not only something that's a puppet of the Germans, it's really uh, the expression of a right-wing movement in France. I wanted to mention this video, a French village. It's in the library at, uh, here at the uh, Cathedral Village and it's available on Prime Video. Uh, it's to me an overwhelming set of videos talking about what is collaboration? What is resistance? Uh, you know, collaboration, after the war, you have all the bad guys collaborated and all the good guys resisted. And what this video does over five seasons, each season is a different year of the war, you begin to see how unclear these questions are. So if someone is accused of collaboration, you also know that what he was trying to do was protect the local population. Uh, you know, I'm not here advertising things, but instead of a book, here's an example of what one, one might wanna look at. Now, another side, not a side issue, but a, uh, issue, did the French government participate in the Holocaust? You know, there is a, uh, some accusations 
1942, there's this uh, infamous roundup of Jews in Paris uh, to the Veldive, Velodon de Vale, to a bicycle stadium. And uh, originally it was supposed to be foreign and stateless Jews. They rounded up 28,000 people, including children. You know, they have, uh, it was July, why'd that happen? July of 42 in Paris, used a French police force, not just then, but elsewhere, quote, independent of the Germans. <clears throat> uh, and there's a mass arrest at other times of 13,000 Jews. Most of these people went to Auschwitz. Uh, and the prime minister at the time, Pierre Laval, was accused and executed in 1945. And for a number, long time, this was seen as uh, expiation of sins. It's all Laval's fault. The Germans didn't, I mean, the French were tools in the hands of Laval. That was his notion. There's another man by the name of René Bousquet, who was head of the French police. Uh, he was found guilty, but then his sentence was commuted because he did help the resistance. And he was indicted again in 1991 when opinions began to change. But the original idea was that everyone who worked for Vichy was, Vichy was bad and, and everyone who worked on the other side was good. In France, you have a funny kind of thing talking about the Jews. Here you have uh, it wasn't our fault. Pétain's government did it. Remember, Marshal Pétain was brought in, becomes the head of the Vichy government. So after the war, the French government says, de Gaulle said it, François Mitterrand, who's a socialist president, starting 1980, said it, and Marine Le Pen, you know, right-wing activist today, says, you know, nothing to apologize for, because it was the... the that government that did it. In 1995, you have, for the first time, the president Jacques Chirac says that day, France committed the irreparable. That is admitting that there is an involvement here in France. Uh, and Francois Hollande says a, a crime committed in France by France. And uh, Macron has repeated these things. So uh, the idea of, what was going on in Vichy is, was and is controversial even on the right. And I wanted to point out what's amazing. Here's a book by an American, Vichy France, published 1970s, where an American turns around what French think of their own history because he looks so closely at what was going on in Vichy. There's a continuity from pre-war to Vichy France, to after the war. Uh, he's, uh, you know, it's a very detailed book, you, but, you know, but it's there. And it's just amazing to me that a book in English could have such an impact. Uh, so, sorry, I moved on here because time is running out. Vichy also had a policy about its colonies. What about the French colonies? They wanted to maintain them. Here they've, they've they're losing, they've lost this war. They're occupied by the Germans for three years and they're still interested in having colonies to all Frenchmen. This is from de Gaulle. France has lost the battle, but France has not lost the war. So that's de Gaulle's notion, but he's not ready to say the colonies are something that should be given up on. And in the colonies, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to know where loyalties lie. In North Africa, on the Algerian coast, you have the French Navy and the British are afraid that the Germans are gonna take that Navy. They attack the Navy and they sink many of the ships. Uh, de Gaulle never forgave the British for doing that. Uh, although it's interesting that a few years later, he, he agrees with the scuttling of the French fleet in Toulouse to prevent the Germans from getting the rest of it. Uh, but what happens 
to Jews under this new regime. You have Jews in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia in particular. Uh, in Algeria, they're stripped of citizenship. Remember, that was one of the exceptions that they had. Uh, in Mor in uh, Morocco, the laws were not quite as vigorous. In Tunisia, if it hadn't been for the defeat of the Germans, it looked like the Tunisian Jews were on the verge of being deported to concentration camps, either in North Africa or in Europe. Uh, remember, some of you probably familiar with these uh, movies about the battles of Rommel in North Africa. Well, the Germans were still fighting that war, uh, didn't get a chance to kill the Jews. They did, however, participate in massacres of some Africans as early as June 1940. Uh, and then Africans in Europe, 100,000 of them, many of them are killed by the Germans. Uh, remember I said they lot them in the army. Well, here, 1940, they're taken prisoner and lots of them were killed. And that's as presumably, pre presumably this is a uh, German soldier here. And these are all uh, Senegalese who are captured In West Africa, although there was a lot of uh, talk about whether it was the Vichy forces or de Gaulle's forces who were being charged, not much military action. Uh, the Vichy government held West Africa, the Gaulle's held Equatorial Africa, the colony, those are colonies down south. In Syria, Vichy held on. In uh, <clears throat> In Morocco, Algeria, when the, when the US soldiers invaded in 1942, there was some firing on them by the Vichy soldiers for a while. Indochina was occupied by the Japanese. Uh, so here you have the French empire. You would think it's falling apart, but the French are not ready to let go of it. Uh, de Gaulle, is in charge, is, calls his forces the Free French. Uh, and we think there are about 300,000 North African Arabs who fought for the Free French. He goes to Brazzaville in Central Africa in 1944. The goal of the work of civilization, remember we had this notion of the civilizing mission of France, undertaken by France and the colonies, exclude all idea of autonomy all possibility of development outside the French block of the empire. The possible constitution self-government in the colonies is to be dismissed. So de Gaulle, who later on is accused by the right wing of giving up all the colonies, in 1944 basis, gives an unequivocal statement. We're not giving up our colonies. They're part of France. One of the shameful things that happens. November 30, 1944, there are a whole number of prisoners of war who are released and come back to Africa. They are promised pay. Mainly, they're called Senegalese, but they're from all over West Africa. They were sent to the camp at Tiahua in West Africa. These are in their uniforms with their uh, characteristic hats. And they demand their pay. What happens is the French eventually fire on them. They claim, they, the French say 35 people died. The African and other, and other historians say that up to 300 people were shot by the French. These are <coughs> French prisoners of war released, went back to Africa, demanded pay equivalent to what other soldiers get. And you have armed repression. This is this image, horrible image of, of killing the Africans. It's hushed up by the history books. Only recently, maybe, I don't know how recent in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and you can see this movie called The Camp at Tiaroa, by a, made by a, a French filmmaker, Ousmane Sembene, French, I mean, French-African, 1988. And when you 
look up the history, people have trouble. So they give you scenes from this movie as though it were from the history book. Uh, but there it is. You can find it. It's got subtitles if you want to watch it. Uh, and here we have a memorial in Mali, Mali being right next to Senegal, to the martyrs in Tiahua. Uh, it was, I mean, I had never, personally, I never heard of this until I started researching this, and it was just really mind boggling what happened. So in 1945, and this is going to be our last slide for today. Here you have French colonies in the world and Vichy and then the fourth republic. Remember we had the third republic from 1870 to 1940. Now we have the fourth republic and they have dreams of empire. So here's France, this light blue here, France and Corsica right there. And where, where are these colonies? Here's the mandates in, in Europe. You have the French colonies in West Africa, the French, uh, Madagascar, Indochina, and uh, here's a list of all of them. Well, not all of them, because this is just a list, because in addition, we have Caribbean islands, we have French Guiana, uh, Guyana, I guess you, I'm not sure how you spell it in English, but now called Guyana, uh, sort 